Let's go to that. Now that the bones of the trunk are discussed, we'll get to the arms and the legs. The shoulder girdle starts with the shoulder blade and the collarbone. What are the anatomical terms of those called? Scapula and clavicle. Good. So when we go into the lecture portion here, the pictures, you got the, the clavicle here, that's the collarbone. And then in the back, you can see that's all scap that's all shoulder blade. All that is shoulder blade. It's going all the way down here, it's all shoulder blade. Let me get John here. The skeleton. Well, it'll be interesting when we have the questions where we start having the right in stuff. Oh, they don't call them. Huh. I do have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know that like, you're trying to follow the test or follow the campus on a book. The hands are nowhere in the book. Oh, yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's yeah. 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 It's true. Yeah. They're not in the book. Can you write me that out? Oh, I, I can write it here. No hands in the book. Uh oh. I'm doing that, you know, that way you learn how to Google things. <laughs> that way you learn the process, the way I make the booklet. I'm sorry. It was on the video. It was on the video. Oh, good. I, I, <laughs> Why did I think I got away with that? Well, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll fix that. <laughs> that's helpful. Okay, but we got that. Huh? That's the first question. And so that gives us... Oh, look, I can go through it now. Here. And so that was okay, right? If you reach one hand onto the opposite shoulder, your palm is touching the trapezius muscle. Yes, your finger tips are likely resting on something harder, a ridge that goes across. That's right here. You feel that? That ridge is called the spine of the scapula. Above as well as below is a shallow depression, a fossa. It's called a fossa, which is good for muscles to attach to. What are those parts of the scapula called? So there is there is there is that ridge. So we have supra and infra and top scap. Above as well as below is a shallow depression fossa. It's good for muscles. To so I think we got in front, super on infra, right? I might. The tricky one is the subscapular fossa is actually also one, so I have to be a little. Well, I have to make sure I take a note because it's a bit too tricky. Because I'm asking for the one below and above, so that's why it's super so, so and infra. So when we look here, we go into the next picture. See, I love these pictures, aren't these cool? Mm -hmm. yeah. That was like, I'm really happy when I found this because you see the motions. And then also I like the stick figure because it sort of helps to understand the arm and the scapula are two joints, they're two different things. Um, and then I did mainly a muscle overview, we get to the muscles later anyway, and a, and a pain thing. What's most important to me about these, I, I got these new into the booklets to get some ideas of what injuries we can have in these joints. What's always most important clinically is the fact that pain and function are related. So if somebody has, you know, a, an injury, what we, pain is fine to help with, the pain medicine is fine to help with, but if we don't improve and work on the function, whatever's going on, with it, then we're not going to get to the healing solution. And that's where we have a lot of problems in musculoskeletal injuries. Anyway, that is the picture though that we're looking for. So the supraspinous pulse is above the spinal the scapula and the infra below. This is, of course, the other side. It's this side, supra and infra. So where's the sub? The sub is underneath. Yeah, the subscapular fossa is underneath it. Oh. So it's the one that goes to the chest. Okay? So that's um, also a muscle attachment. Because when you look here, uh, then these, the, I like these color ones actually. Uh, this area and this area become a muscle attachment for muscles. They're called the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. 
So the muscles are then named according to the bony part. So that will be helpful. And there is going to be a muscle on the bottom, and that's called the subscapularis muscle that we're going to get to. And those are, have you ever heard of rotator cuffs? Those are the rotator cuff muscles. It's just one more, there's four of those. <clears throat> so that's pretty good. So now let's go to question three. Can you read the, this level? If you put your finger back to the spine scapula and follow it to the shoulder, you can feel that the end widens and gets bony. That is the place where the collarbone forms a joint with the scapula. What is the anatomical term used for the outside lateral tip of the scapula. Or the A word. The A word. The, no, you can't say that. The chromium. The chromium. The chromium. <laughs> Can I say the A word in some video? <laughs> so we get the spine of the scapula, follow it out, the right here, that's the tip of the shoulder. So on ourselves, we take the spine, we go to the tip of the shoulder, that's right here. You can feel that. We're gonna have, on Wednesday, we're gonna do some integration work, I hope, with a posture analysis, so you have to find these landmarks on each other, a few of those. That's why we do those, because the stuff sticks out, so that, and that can help you. So that's the acromion, and if you feel it yourself, you feel there's a little edge, and then it drops down, and then it's roundy. You feel that? So the edge is the scapula, the roundy is the arm bone. So that's where that shift is. Good, acromion. And you got it right. Right here, spine of chromium, that's how we spell it. But that's a picture, that's a picture from the side. The straight, this way from the side in here. And so the chromium is gonna be um, up here. And then in front here, we got a tip, right in here. That's also a name that we need to learn. And that name is called the coracoid process. Here we go. Coracoid process. See that? Is that a quiz question? Uh -huh. Oh, good. Let's go to it. <laughs> oh, me. That's long. <coughs> that's the answer to the next question. Oh, good. Coracoid. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to put your hand on the front of the shoulder, opposite leg, around it. So, oh, I can explain it. That. So, so when you when you go when you go up to the side, you you have this edge, and then you drop off. It's round. That's the arm bone. So you go back to the edge and you actually yeah, go just medial you, from the rounding, go medial on the rounding and then you get a divot and then a second bump. That second bump is the coral horse process. If you poke it, it hurts. It does. Well, that's, you know, there's, there's reason for that. Right? And so the way I remember that bone is, is right here. See that here? And so, you know, in the, in the witch, when the witch got the raven on top, Sitting on top, it says Kakai, And so that's how I remember that thing. So it's like right here. I know. Muscle attachment bump. Coracoid process. Now we get to the upper arm. What's that called? The humerus. And it's not funny. It's just called a humerus. I don't know why it's called a humerus, actually. Um, Oh, we have these multiple bumps, and that was one of the mistake questions. But when you look at the humerus, that's the upper arm bone. So we already found some of that roundy stuff. Actually, let's go to the other side because this is the other side. So on this side, the roundy that you feel is not the head of the humerus, but it's one of these bigger bumps called the tubercle. The greater tubercle is right out here, and then we got a lesser tubercle that's right next to it. One is bigger, one is smaller. The greater is the one on the outside, the lesser is more to the front. <laughs> but it's not the same as the bump that hurts. You know, those bumps are then a little smaller, so it's a little harder to feel. Um, and then in between those two bumps, you have a groove that goes up and down, a shallow depression, we can call it, and they can call that the inner tubercular sulcus, or they also call that the inner tubercular groove. And that's where the big, the, this muscle goes in, the biceps brachii goes through that as it goes into the shoulder. 
So the tangent goes, there's the tangent goes through here. I know when I first came to America and I, I did massage school, and they start talking this anatomy stuff, and this lady, she's like, and this is a bicipital groove, and I'm like, groove? <laughs> groove? That's music, isn't that music? And the whole 30 people were laughing their butt off. Oh, God. New to the country. <laughs> I know, right? So the question here is, is greater and less than two people, right? And, 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 it, and, it, and it had only greater first on it? That's why some of you guys got it wrong. That's, that's your luck since you're the first class with these kind of canary things. I know, you've got to be the canary in my coal mine. There's no superior, no posterior, that's all there is. And then, as you as you go, and again you want you learn the most. Oh, you know you should have some of these things on your desk. Hold on, we should have these on your desk. Who help me? Who help me? There you go. One desk, take one. Bones. So, so um, the, the next bump that we want to bump into is we go the arm, we go on the outside arm, and we go down to you know you got this muscle pack here on the shoulder, right below that muscle pack you got a bump. Feel it? You got to feel it. You poke it, it hurts a little bit. You can feel it. I <laughs> well, it's right here. There's the bump. You you wanna you wanna know these things on the on the bones, of course. But it's also good to you know learn some of them on the body because it's a landmark. And so and like when we do posture, posture is very important. If you sit like this all the time, you think you're thinking you, you think your thinking is clear. No, this is much better. So anyway, that bump here is where this muscle attaches into. A lot of times a bony bump is a muscle attachment. It's a roughage on the muscle. You can just feel a roughage on, on your, on your bo bones over there. It's not much felt. And that's, that's named after the muscle that an anchors into it, and that's the deltoid muscle. So this is the deltoid tuberosity. And I think that was the next question, right? Deltoid tuberosity, see? We're on top of it today. Now we're on the fingers and thumb down the arm towards the elbow on both sides, both the inside and the outside. You feel the humerus widens towards the end. You feel that? You go down, it gets wider down here. Especially on the inside. Have you ever banged that thing? It hurt. It's right bone, skin, the corner, of whatever it is you bang. It is also the funny bone is right here. The bump is here, the funny bone is right here. So it's right next to it. That the funny bone is a nerve. Bone, you, you know. um, and so what's the inside bump called? No. That's this one. Oh, we're now number eight. Uh -huh. Oh, medial. Medial epicondyle. Yeah. Good. When I go back here, you see medial, the medial it bumps up a little bit, and here it bumps out a little bit too, that would be the lateral at the corner. So you got one on the outside, one on the inside. Epi, the word epi means above something. Or the out, or yeah, on top. Epi means above or on top something. Because when you look at the word condyle, didn't we have that word before? Yes. Like here, right? In the jaw, on the skull, makes a joint. A condyle makes a joint. Well, this doesn't make a joint. It's an epicondyle. And so the condyles are here making joints. The epicondyle is above it on both sides. We have the same in the knee. Or the femur, actually. But the lower leg too. Um, 
So a condyle always makes a joint. An epicondyle will become a muscle attachment. As a matter of fact, all the muscles pretty much in the inside here, the front, those ones that flex, that bend the wrist, they're all pretty much attached here as a common place of attachment. And then they reach forward from there. So we'll get to that when we do muscle. Where's the lateral one? The lateral one is, your, oh, that's on the other one. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's down here. I'm not really going for it okay. in terms of test or so. Okay. Well, the other bump that, um, and I'm also, I'm also not focused in, in the elbow, in the humerus, the, the condyles have two names. They don't call them condyles. They call them trochlea, this bump here, and then the other bump, the other bumps on the other side is called the capitulum. Right here, that roundy stuff is the capitulum. And so, that, but the naming went, you know, that they specified those, uh, and they don't just call them condyles, but the word epicondyle stayed around. Are they on our list? They are. Epicondyle should be on our list. Yeah, but there's two other, the um, catalog, What? The, the ones that no, you just talked about. Those oh, the trope, the, the capitulum on the yeah. list? No, no. They I'm shouldn't be on the list. list. Yeah, no, 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 I don't want you to worry about those. There's too much. Those yeah, no, no, those are... I'm not putting, that's just to explain it. Um, I mean, it, they're interesting parts because the, the capitulum is round. Capitulum means head. So that's why they called it capitulum before the head. So it's not that off. And trochlea is a pulley. And it's like these edgy things to trochlea. So it's interesting that way too. Uh, when you look at who comes afterwards, you know, in the outside where we have the roundy thing, we're gonna have a round bone Right here, the radius is around bone up here, so that's going to fit in there nicely. So we'll get to that in a minute. But we got a few more turns on here, I think. We have to know the tip of the elbow over there. Yeah, nine. Oh, uh, one more bump here that I need you to understand, and that is the uh, olecranon fossa, and that's on the back side of the elbow. <coughs> It's the shallow depression. You see that in the back here. When you bend the elbow you have, there's a shallow thing that you can put your thumb in. If you bend it. And when you straighten it out, the lower arm bone has a hook. And that hooks into it. You see that? And so the, the hook, it's going to be called the olecranon process. The place where it goes in on the humerus is called the olecranon fossa. And so when you see the word fossa, you're always thinking a shallow depression of some kind. Something, a fossil that goes. No, this. What are you looking for? What the fossa is? Mm -hmm. yeah. You can't feel it on yourself. What you can feel on yourself is the tip of your elbow. You feel the tip of your elbow? Mm -hmm. The tip of your elbow is the electron on process. So it's, but it's a, that, that's a bump from the lower arm. Bump, right? And that fits into that shallow depression. You can probably, no, because you know I can't feel it, because above, uh, on top of it is a big tendon. The, all the muscle here, the tendon goes right into here, and so it obscures it. It, it, it goes over it, so you can't feel that bump in there. But it's there, olecranon falso. That's on the list, right? Mm -hmm. Good, should be on the list. Otherwise, we're gonna put it on the list. Um, two arm bones and the forearm, what are they called? And the radius, yes. good job. And then we got wrist bones. How many wrist bones? Oh my god, what, yeah. are, what am I thinking here? Hold on. Your wrist bent where the carpal bones are found. The wrist is a small area that holds a bunch of small looking bones. Eight of them, thank god. I don't have to teach you which ones are which. Thank god. There are eight. Yeah, I don't even have a picture book, right? <laughs> I don't. That is goofy. But I read it, that book, I must have been real tired of it. <laughs> but anyway, so there are difficult names like hammy, ca uh, capitate, lunate, all kind of funny names. They are the junction between your forearm and your hand. The web of your hand is made up of metacarpals. How many metacarpals do you have in each hand? How do you think? Five. You think five? Yes. Good. It should have been five, even though the picture's not on the book. Let me show you the picture here. What? 
Is it on the list? Yeah. Well, he's on the list. I got. Huh? Well, yeah, but that's baseline. Now you gotta, you gotta, you gotta. So I gotta teach you that, and you have to just take notes. There is a favorite, a famous anatomy professor from Berkeley. I don't know if she's still with us. Marion Dime, best teacher in the world. She does not give you any handout. She writes everything on the blackboard. And I was trying to copy her at their work. I can't draw. <laughs> I need pictures. But this one you can draw because, and I will put it in for the next class. I'm very sorry. But these here are the carpals. So the carpals are right here. So on your right hand, where it bends are the carpals. Where it bends are the carpals. You see this bump here on you? That's, that's the forearm bone end of it, the distal end. That's just called the styloid process there. And after that's the last end of the forearm bone. Anything after that is carpal. That's right here is carpal. So they have two rows of carpal. They're very narrow next to each other. But one is here, and the other one is right here. And one we call, one we call the proximal row, one we call the distal row. I'm not needing you to name, need those, know those names. You just know that these are carpals. All right? And then after the carpals, we get the web of the hand. And in essence, you're already thinking finger. Because look at that. It's all continuous. So you've got five of these things. All right, you've got five metacarpals. So these are the metacarpals here. But you've got five of them. It's kind of like, it's like the fingers, but this is the web of the hand. If you feel, you feel these bones inside. You feel these five things. As a matter of fact, I had a student once, a teacher, who came and says, you know, this student really hurt her hand and she needs to go to the emergency room, but she doesn't want to go to the emergency room. Can you tell if she broke a hand? And if you, if you break a bone, if you break a bone and it has a crack in it and you vibrate it, it hurts like hell. So you take a, one of the best ways of figuring out if you have broken bone, you take a tuning fork. A low vibrating 128 tuning fork. If you put it on the bone, it hurts. You're going to have a problem. Yes? Can you show, can you show that to us on your hand? Yeah, right here. That's the that's, that's the carpals, mm -hmm. and then from here upward in the web of the hand is the metacarpals. Okay. Okay. And then above that, that's the phalanges. The fingers are the phalanges. So anyway, so this lady, so the comments, in, and I'm like, it hurts. She's like, you go, what did you do? She's like, well, let's just say I dropped a case of wine on my hand. I'm like, no, we didn't. <laughs> so she punched out the boyfriend's lover's girlfriend's whatever face or something <laughs> which is very appropriate but she still had to go so what she had was called a ballroom fracture and so when you punch somebody this bone is very wimpy so it breaks fast it's right here so that's that metacarpal that breaks most likely so don't do that mm -mm. Um, when we get to the phalanges what we need to be aware of in the phalanges these are the fingers the thumb has two bones in it, you can only bend one joint in there. In the fingers, you can bend three. I mean, two joints, you have three bones. So we have one, two, three, one, two. When we have three, we call the one closest to the web of the hand, the proximal, the middle, and the distal. And in the thumb, we just have a proximal and the distal. We don't have a middle. And the same architecture is true for the foot. The same thing. Good, so that was five metacarpals in the picture you didn't have. Sorry about that. I know. Oh, look at that. Now, the fingers are quite remarkable. They're composed of three. Oh, look at that. We have already answered that. How many, how many digits, how many phalanges, actually, phalanges refer to the bones. Sorry about that. Let me back off. Phalanges are the bones. Digits is the whole finger. So how many phalanges of the thumb have? Two. Two. Good. Come on, there you go. Coolio, now we get to the leg. Pelvis first. Uh-huh. 
sacrum, remember the sacrum, at the end of the spine. On each side are attached two big roundish like flat bones. The two of them meet the front, right below the stomach, that's the pubic bone. Put your hands on the side and feel the ridge of the bone is where you can conveniently can carry the baby or some other stuff. Uh, can you name that part of the pelvis? Iliac crest. There you go. So, let's go to the picture of that. Here we go. <clears throat> so that's the hip from the front. The pelvis from the front, that's here. The iliac crest is right here with a, with a crest. It's a ridge. The crest is a ridge. In actuality, the pelvis hemispheres are made of three bones that fuse together. So that's one of those synostoses, they call that. Ost anything osto or osteo is bone. Whenever you hear osteo or osteo, you think of bone. Um, so the bones that are fused are known as the ish ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. Um, and then uh, you can see them in different colors in the picture that shows the bone from the side. You got that in your book? Let's go for that. There you go. You see the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. Those are the three bones. They meet where the acetabulum is, which is where the hip, where the, where the leg bone comes into the hip. The ilium is the largest on top at uh, the arches in this top portion, it connects the spine to either side of the sacrum. Can you name those two joints that it makes? The no, the sacral iliac joint. No? We're on 13. You're trying to trick me, huh? So when you make a joint, you always name the I mean, now there is some alternative names, but, but you're never wrong, I think I could say that, if you name the joint by the two bones that make it up. So you don't call it sacral pelvic joint here, but you call it sacral iliac joint because the bone is the ilium that it connects to. So it, it holds true still. So when you don't understand it, then you look for the bony parts but the joint name is always those two, two bones coming together make that name. So that's why I put that in there. That's a good example of that. Put your hand on the back of the leg crest. Feel the fingers towards the back until a distinct bump, abrupt finish. The crest now, look at the picture and show the bone from the side. What is the bump that your fingers are feeling called? I can't get that one wrong. What's the answer You go backwards. So what you do here, is you are in the crest and you go back till you hit a bump. The bump's right here. You feel that bump on you? It's a big bump. I mean, I got a big bump, but it's still a big bump. And that's the bump in here. And that, what's that bump called? Posterior, superior, iliac spine. PSIS. Posterior, superior, iliac spine. So those, we use that abbreviation for that. When we when we go to the front, when we go on the crest and we move to the front, not to the back, we also get to a place where it's not a bump, it's just sort of stops right there. And that point here is known as the anterior superior iliac spine. Anterior superior iliac spine. Posterior superior iliac spine, anterior superior iliac spine. Two landmarks I need you to know. Because they're right here, you feel that, the front, before you get into that inguinal ligament, and then in the back you got that big bump. And there we go. One more joint in there that we need to look at. Oh no, look at, now we go to the sit bone. The sit bone is right here. So if you're actually sitting properly, <laughs> who does, right? If we're if we're sitting properly, oh, I can't do this here. If we're sitting properly, we're sitting on the sit bone. Most of us sit on the sacrum. So most of us sit on their ass, and some sit on the sit bone. 
Now, it's, it's not easy to do that, but it makes a huge difference. Because if you sit on the sit bone, all of this is pretty straight. If you sit on your butt, this goes back. And if you like, you consider you have a, a wheel here, a wheel here, and a wheel here from the side, you want them aligned. That's good posture. As soon as you lose that, you go like that. And so one way, and it's really hard. You know, especially you got a typing job or some weird, you know, it's really, really tough to be like, not like, I mean, the best thing is you don't sit. But one thing you can do is you can sit on the edge of the, cha of the chair. Some of my, my, my massage therapist, she taught the students, that, that, their, that her patients or uh, clients to pull their cheek and the butt little out, and so that helps. That's for us big butt people, you know. And then, but then the other thing is you can sit on a wedge. You can sit on an incline a little bit, and if you sit on an incline, you can't slouch. It's really hard to slouch. So I give that to people. Either put some newspaper or something in the back of the chair, make a slouch, or get a little foam for that. So you can't, a little foam wedge, so you can't slouch. It doesn't take much, like this much in the back, and in the front is this. I have some of the off. So that's the issue to porosity. Le sit bon. Well, if you name it something like ischial tuberosity, I mean, who knows what that means? You've got to call it simple. That way, we know it. Um, and now, Stephanie. <laughs> now we get to the front. So we have, in the back, we got the sacroiliac joint, the sacrum come together, the sit bone here. We take the, we have the bump in the back, the PSIs, the crest go forward into the ASIs, and then all the way down, oh, we got the two bones come together. Right here in the front. And that's known as the pubic the pubic's emphasis. Very important bone. If you have been pregnant, a lot of people get pubic symphysitis. Have you had that? Oh, hang on. That's like an inflammation of the Of that joint. You can imagine you're trying to walk. <laughs> you know, that's hard. I mean, and you're pregnant, it's like you don't have a stomach because you drink too much beer. It's because it's the baby, and that means it's behind the stomach wall, so all the muscles are pushed forward. So you know, so you know, next time, guys who don't understand that, or ladies who haven't had a baby, if you see a pregnant lady wobbling, you be very kind to her, <laughs> <laughs> and don't try to run her down because you're not walking fast enough because she can, and she's making a freaking human inside. Jesus. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the thigh bone. Uh, has a round head that fits nicely into the pelvis. Can you name the socket it fits in? Acetabulum. The acetabulum. Huh? Well, it's huh? Acetabulum. Acetabulum. So it's acetate, no, acetabulum, uh, I don't know, you know, you gotta go. When I went to Switzerland, and you know, and I, can, and I speak these words in German, it's like so weird because you hear something, you say like, what does that sound like? And then you think about it, and it's the same word, but it's differently pronounced, so you can pronounce it however you want. That's the cool. <laughs> no, that's the nice, acetabulum, acetabulum. Oh, you go for it. <laughs> Well, at least you gotta have fun with them. Come on. <laughs> okay, so then the obturator for amen is another hole that we have, and I just think it's on the list. Is this one in here? It's covered with a membrane. It's, it has some muscles that are on the ridge, but it doesn't really have anything go through it. It's sort of like just there. For us, that's just there. And then if you palpate your fingers pushing in from the side at the top of the thigh, you'll feel a hard, blunt, round structure. It's a bony prominence that serves as a side of many muscle attachments, some that prevent the pelvis from falling down, blah, blah, blah. Can you name that part of the femur? Greater, uh, greater trochanter. Trochan. There you go. That's the bump right here. Right here, see how big that is? That's huge. So all the muscles that attach around here, but you have a lot of muscles attached around here. Have you ever heard of piriformis? Piriformis syndrome, no? Sciatica, no? Oh, yeah, yeah The glutes, have you heard of the glutes? The glute muscles? Yeah, yeah. You know, have you heard of Brazilian butt? Have you heard of a Brazilian, that's the glutes. So all those muscles, they, they pretty much go into here. 
So they're like the outside of a wheel, sort of, or a half wheel that is baked into here. And so whatever we do with this, where we have to pull on this bone so the leg goes, that's where we can attach these muscles. So that's the greater trochanter. We have a small bone on the inside, that's the lesser trochanter. Greater, lesser. The lesser is really small on the thigh. On the humerus, the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle are much more similar in size. And they have two, so we have two down here too. So we have a trochanter greater and a lesser trochanter. Where's the um, Trochanter means big bump. Tubercle means small bump. Sometimes they interchange. Sometimes they use the word trochanter for the arm or even tubercle for the leg. But so you just know that the trochanter means big bump and tubercle means small bump, technically speaking. Good, so that's good. Which one is small or which one's big? The inside one is small. Lesser is small. Then I want you to reach in the back of your thighs while you're sitting. You will likely feel a muscle on either side. If you press deep, your fingers will feel the back of the femur. Up and down the back is a rough line which serves as tremendous muscle attachment sites. Many of the quads. The quads are your front muscles, right? They are attached back here and they reach around to ankle into the knee. Can you imagine when somebody kicks you how much force there is? Or you kick a ball. That's why soccer is so popular. Biggest muscle. Well, you know, when when we have anxiety in the brain, neurons can only fire and talk to other neurons, other nerve cells, to muscle cells, and to sweat gland cells. So some people get stressed out, they start smelling. The sweat glands go. Some people, they start talking. The tongue's a muscle. Some people go nuts. And some people run around. And so if you see some like these kids playing soccer, so it's just it's perfect psychotherapy. Use all that energy that's in the brain up. That we, you know, that's part of the reason why exercise is so good. Because it uses that excessive nervous energy up and it lets it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, the quads. Um, can you name the line of the bone roughage? Isn't that a nice name? Yes. Linea aspera. Uh, I mean, I don't know how to pronounce that in, in English, you know, that's like a little hard. So, on here, oh, we haven't talked about male and female pelvis, huh? We gotta get worried about that. So we have the bump, the head. There also is a neck. We didn't talk about the neck, but wherever you have a head, most likely there's a neck. And then we got the big bump and the small bump. The greater trochanter is on, on, oops, on this side, sorry. On this side. And the lesser trochanter is on the other side, right here. And the line that I was referring to is in the back view, that's the front view, and that's right here, that line. Can you feel that on the, on the bone on the table? It's that, that reaching thing here. That's that linear spera. It's got a huge amount of muscles going in there. All of those quads, and then also all of the adductors that go to the inside are attached to them. And that brings us to the next question, the knee. Now let's grab your knee with a finger circle around the kneecap, the patella. If your knee is bent and relaxed, you can feel the distal end of the femur. And you run your fingers deep into the patella. There are two, two rounded, bloody, rounded bony ends that you can feel. It's kind of hard to feel, but if you really visualize it, you can do feel it. And, and you can feel it on these. You feel here, you bend the knee, and you feel these two things. What are those things called? The condyles. That's that joint thing, right? So there's the condyles on the femur, and then we have, let me show you. Oh, I got a lecture on this too, it's kind of interesting. So we have the condyles on the femur down here, these round the bone things. And then we get to the lower bone, and that's the tibia, which is the next bone, and look at that, we've got more condyles. 
an outer medial and lateral column now making a joint. So that's kind of helpful to have all these be the same names. I know. You know, that's, you have to copy whatever you can. You copy and multiply. So column down is one of those words that you just know about. Then he's interesting, the top end of the tibia of your shin bone is a plateau. The two ends of the femur on either side curve from front to back. When we bend the knee, they roll on the plateau. Two plastic round discs, wedges, cartilages are guiding the movement. What are those cartilages called? Meniscus. The meniscus. Have you heard of a torn meniscus? No, thank you. They can crack. Ooh, and that's not pretty. So the knee is kind of interesting. You know, you see, this is the menisci here. These are the condyles, uh, the, the femoral, uh, the, the tibial condyle. And then when, when, you tr when you're bending the knee, it's like this. It's not like, it's not like this. It's, or it's not like this. It's like rolling. So the top femur rolls on the plateau. That's one reason why you don't want a knee in front of the foot when you do an exercise. Because you roll off the plateau. It's too much force this way, and the plateau bends then in this direction, and gravity will pull it down. Because when you look at the inside of the knee, the ligaments, remember ligaments go from bone to bone, and they hold the bones together, right? You got a ligament on the outside, going from femur to tibia, I mean on the inside, on the outside, and then on Deep inside the joint, you've got two ligaments going up and down. They call them the cross, the uh, anterior, the cruciate ligaments. Cruciate means cross. The ACL, have you heard of an ACL tear? Mm -hmm. That's the ligament ACL. That's the uh, um, anterior cruciate ligament. That's one that goes up and down. And then there's one in the back. One resists the motion going forward and the other one backwards. That's what they do. And so if we're standing here and we're going too far forward and falling off that plateau because it can't hold it, we can break some of that ligament. You know. Or of course you think somebody playing soccer and gets land from the back or something, then that of course breaks as well. Um, um, anyway, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about with the meniscus is that rounding of the joint versus the closing of it. So that's uh, I think clinically very important. Under the knee, in the front of the bump, there's a bump. I mean, there's a bump on a bone in the front. There's an attachment of the quads in there. You may know uh, this problem as, what is it called? Tibial tendinitis, Oscar Schlauer's. Have you heard of that? In young teenage boys particularly? They keep running, 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 running. They don't stop running. These muscles grow like crazy. This bone doesn't go like it's so crazy. And the tendon pulls on the bone, and it makes this bump really big, and it gets inflamed. And that bump is what the answer is for, for, for this question. Tibial tuberosity is where the quads go into the bone, into the tibia. So that's a very prone problem. I had some young guy, I mean, this stuff is like, you know, it's like sticking out on some of these guys. Because the, the, the tendon pulls on the moss on the bone, and the bone will respond and make more bone to protect. Oh, you have you? Did you, you have pain with it? No. Not really. I don't like touching it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not gonna have everybody come by and poke on it. <laughs> yeah, mine is pretty big too. I had tibial tendon. I Oscar Schlauer's a little bit. Um, the outside leg bone. Oh, but let me tell you this. So this is the funny thing. So you got these kids. They get Oscar Schlauer's, and we'll probably talk about it again. But the mom goes to the doctor, or the dad goes to the doctor. The kid is like. You have to not do any work. You can't do sports. You're 17 and you've got to sit at home. Well, that's going to be fine. <laughs> and so they say it takes like two years to heal, heal the thing. And so I, I looked up because one of my, my sandwich guys' son had it. And so I was like, let me, let me do some reading on it. And I found this PT from, from Australia, Strickland is her name, and she does PT for uh, Olympic people. So she's really high end. And she has this method where in three weeks she can fix the problem. And what's the method? She takes oil and massages the quads from top to bottom and lengthens it, so to speak, to give the joint, to give them more room down there instead of it always pulling on it. How complicated is that? It's like straightforward. You can like, oh yeah, it pulls where the muscle goes into the bone. Let's make the muscle a little bit longer thinking. It's not more than that. 
And I think it's always so interesting because this, the, the solutions are often in simplicity. They're not in complicated. And so when I have somebody that pulls here somewhere or something, I'm like, yeah, let's massage it down and make some more room. You know, apply the same principle. And so that, I learned about that a, a few years back. That was really cool. Uh, the outside leg bone is the fibula. It doesn't bear much weight, but, all, but helps absorb shock and stabilize the body from falling, collapsing the outside. A thick ligament-like fascia, fascial structure firmly holds the tibia and the fibula together. What is it called? Interosseous membrane. Inter means in between. Osseous is bone. And so we have these, we have these membranes. Um, come on. Right in here. <laughs> What happens, what happens in the lower leg here, or in the leg, this is called the thigh, this is called the leg, actually, in anatomy. So the membrane is right in here. When you, when you look at the musculature, well, and the membrane keeps this nice together, this leg down here, nice together. When you do a lot of jumping, what happens when you walk and jump, this bone moves up a little bit, it gives a little bit. So a lot of jumping, this gives, gets a little strain, a little weaker, a sprain a little bit weaker, and, and the bones wear out a little bit. So one of the things you could do in, I do in clinic, I, I give, them a give patients a strap around here, like an inch that with Velcro that wraps around that can hold these bones together when they go hiking or so, or walking, so it doesn't spread out and it doesn't hurt as much. Uh, is that what they use that for? Uh, that <laughs> <laughs> I that some of it, some of it is <laughs> cutting the tendon as well. So I'm not totally sure, you know, it's sporty. I go for the bone right in here. And, and, um, but the other thing I want to talk about that is because in, muscularly speaking, you're going to have muscles in the front here. You're going to have muscles in the deep back, right by that membrane. And then on top of that, you've got you know, the gastrocs that you can see, right? The, the outside muscles. And on the outside here, you have another set of muscles. So you have all these different compartments where you've got these muscles in, and this membrane holds the bones together so these compartments can be made where the muscles go in. And muscles are surrounded by an envelope of fascia, like the white stuff, that then anchors it, that becomes the tendon and anchors into the bone. But it goes around the whole muscle. And so muscle has to, muscle um, contracts and, and shortens, but when it does that, it gets bigger and fat, and it pushes against that membrane. And about 30% of the force comes from pushing against that membrane. But when you do a lot of jumping, you get these compartment syndrome sometimes. And so the muscle pushes always against the membrane and cannot relax. And it becomes inflamed and it becomes tortured. So what they do in extreme cases, they cut that membrane open to give the muscles a room. But then, of course, if you're an athlete, you're losing 30% of your power. And so that's where that. But that's where that membrane becomes very important of what does it do? It holds these bones together. And one of the reasons is that these compartments can be formed, so the whole thing can, you know, function, function as a unit. Then the more you spread this out in the part, the more tense everything gets. And so this is interesting. And the fibula has a lot to do. And the muscles behind the fibula get are very often very tight because that's a, the muscles you tighten when you twist your ankle. And we'll talk about that on, I don't know, next week. And we get to the foot, I think, almost. One more bump, we need a couple more bumps we need to know here, is the medial malleolus, the lateral malleolus. And you know the medial, if you, you banged this probably before. The inside one, I banged this bad. That, you know that bump, it's like this one, the malleolus. Same one. All right. Number 24. Number 24. This two, TV, what is the answer? What are the bumps? Oh, there you go. <laughs> I thought we were going to the Calcaneus already. No. I guess we're going to the 24th. Now we go, what, what's that called? When, we walk, when you walk and lift your leg, one leg, all the weight of your body comes down on that one leg. Have you ever thought of that? That's crazy, right? And through the top ankle bone, it gets distributed towards the back where we have a heel bone and to the front where we ideally have multiple bones in a row that make two arches that absorb the shock. So we have, when we look at the foot, we get that weight come down. The one bone here is called the talus, 
it comes right onto that talus, and then the way it goes back, that's the heel bone, and the heel bone will be called the calcaneus. That's a whole bone. And then in the front, we have these multiple bones. It's like the carpals. It's now it's called tarsals, not carpals. But it's the same thing. Um, and they make this row, and this is the longitudinal arch they create. So if you've got flat feet, you don't have that arch or not as much. That's one place where I think you should have a little help. I have inserts that have a little help to create that arch because walking on, on concrete is really hard. And everything that goes down on here translates up. So if somebody has one flat foot and not the other flat foot as much, you will unbalance the whole skeletal system. So that can be a problem. Another thing that I often find with the, the calcaneus, it's tipped inward a little bit. Like it's twisted a little bit, and then these get really tight on the outside. And so that's the calcaneus. So that one I work, when I work on patients with lower body, I always pretty much work the calcaneus. It's always a little bit like twisted to the outside. And it's interesting, it makes a huge difference. Okay, so I think that's it, huh? There are the arches. Where are the arches? That's a lot of stuff, huh? Does that make sense, though? Yeah? Well, what I think we should do for the rest of the time is go to each other and go down that list. And I walk around and I'll come answer questions. And if you have skulls, just go to work.